Hello, my name is Christoph Stork, and I'm with Land Seismic Noise Specialists. My talk is evidence that land seismic surface scattering noise can be treated as correctable signal distortion. Scattering noise is often a big problem with land seismic data, and this scattering is a physical phenomenon that is repeatable and measurable. The scattering noise can be considered complex distortion of signal, not just unwanted energy. And if we can convert this scattering noise back to signal, even partially, this is a big win. And this perspective is a significant change for land seismic data. There are a number of important implications of this perspective. The implications affect processing, acquisition, and interpretation. In processing, you can recover more signal by correcting the distortion. And this, of course, is very significant. In acquisition, dense acquisition won't entirely remove the noise on its own. Dense acquisition also won't solve the distortion problem because you just record more distorted signal. Surface noise characteristics can change a lot over a small scale, and this has interesting implications if you can use LIDAR to predict the noise. In interpretation, large-scale distortion will affect impedance inversion, well ties, and pre-stack attributes if the distortion is not corrected for. But also just big picture understanding of land seismic data. First is that the dominant problem noise of land seismic data is often not surface waves. The mainly statistical approach to land noise has its limits and FWI and other near surface inversion methods followed by noise subtraction is impractical and unnecessary for the foreseeable future, say the next 10 or 20 years. My outline is I'm going to explain micro scattering, show how apparently random scattering noise is repeatable and measurable, look at synthetic data and measure the source wavelet using VSP, look at real data and show how correcting the distortion improves the data, and finally show how scattering distortion explains many characteristics that we see with land seismic data. So here's a diagram of the near surface scattering, and I call this micro scattering because of the small scale of the heterogeneities and the limited distance it travels. This depth here is only 3 to 30 meters, and horizontally, this is only 30 to 100 meters. You can see that this is very slow velocity here in the top unconsolidated. The velocities are often on the order of 100 to 200 meters per second. And what that means is that, well, it traps a lot of the source energy, 95 to 99% of the source energy. But then the heterogeneities here, the small scale heterogeneities, will scatter a lot of the energy and they act as secondary sources. And heterogeneities on the order of one meter are important. And the near surface is very heterogeneous on this scale. Now there has been much work done on larger scale scattering. But I argue this micro scattering is a stronger phenomenon and must be treated differently because of the scale. Here's a nice satellite picture showing near surface heterogeneity. This is a meandering stream bed, of course, and I want to emphasize that lots of natural processes cause significant variations on all scales. Here's a road cut that shows small scale heterogeneities. You see there are trees here, so we're looking at a depth of maybe 10 to 20 meters. 
Now these type of heterogeneities exist in karsted areas and in foothill areas. And these blocks are of size about one meter. Now the slow surface velocity caused the seismic wavelength to be about one to five meters in size. So these small scale heterogeneities have a big effect and this will cause a lot of scattering. Here's a nice video example of surface scattering. This is a sand dune that you have here on the surface, which is ringing a long time after the source. Um, this video is associated with this paper. This video is actually on YouTube. And it's this paper. Um, this is work done at Schlumberger. And you can see the scattering is very complex. Now, if there had been more surface heterogeneity, such as in real life, you know, for example, you would have more sand dunes spread around, I think you can see the scattering would be a real mess, be much more complex than what you see here. And this is the effect of the scattering on upcoming wave fields. The scattering distorts reflections and it makes them look like random noise and can reduce signal to noise by 10x to 100x. So without surface scattering, you might have clean reflections like this. With surface scattering, you have distorted reflections where you see a lot of scattering of the clean reflections. You see these inverted Vs and hyperbolas. Now the near surface often has very slow velocities. So you generally won't see these inverted Vs or hyperbolas. You won't, you won't see these scattering patterns with non-dense trace spacing, say trace spacing greater than three or five meters. Here's shot gathers that show the phenomenon of the previous slide. This is a shot gather with NMO. And on the left, you see a shot gather with little micro scattering distortion, and the reflections are pretty clear and clean. But on the right, we move the source and receivers a few hundred meters, and now we have some significant micro scattering distortion. Now, the noise on the right appears random. And it's certainly complex, but it is repeatable and measurable if you know how to look. And I'll show you that later on. So this is scattering distortion, not just unwanted energy. And you can partially undo the distortion to recover the clean reflectors. Here's a video of an upcoming wavefront being scattered at the surface. This is certainly very significant scattering. You can see that most of the energy back here is scattered. And this initial first arrival here is now significantly weaker. Now, if you had a second wave front 100 or 200 milliseconds after this first wave front, you wouldn't be able to see it. It would be hidden in the noise of the first wave front. So in this case, about 95% of the energy is scattered with 5% remaining as signal. Now, if this happens at the source and receiver, in each case, you have a 20x reduction of signal for a net total reduction of 400x. Here we plot the noise amplitude as a function of scattering ratio down here. And notice that the vertical axis is a log plot, so noise goes up dramatically with the higher scattering ratios over here on the right side. Now good data is in this region with a noise to signal ratio of about one. Mediocre data is in this region where noise to signal goes up to about 10x. And then bad data is in this region with the noise to signal varying between 10 and 100. 
Now, a small reduction in scattering ratio through processing or acquisition can be a big help. Let's go back to this data. The noise on the right looks random, and it's certainly complex, but I'm going to show you how to find the coherent wavelet distortion in this complex scattering. And what we're going to do is we're going to take two neighboring traces in this data and perform cross correlations. So what we're going to do is we're going to take two receivers. In this case, they're spaced by 165 feet or 50 meters. And then for each source, we're going to isolate one wave mode and then take the traces from these two receivers and cross correlate them. And then we'll do it for each consecutive source and we'll plot them all next to each other. And that is what we've done here. Each of these traces is a cross correlation of two traces from the same neighboring receivers from one shot. And then we repeat this for many shots. So what was previously noisy, complex, and apparently random data now has a very clear repeatable pattern over numerous shots. You can see the very clear consistency between these neighboring traces, although things change at this offset range here. Now, if the receiver response function for the two receivers was identical, you would just have a central peak at zero lag down here. All the energy away from the central, from the zero lag is wavelet distortion. I argue that this consistency of the cross correlation is evidence that the scattering effect can be considered a repeatable wavelet distortion. And note that there is much energy away from the zero lag, so the scattering fraction here is about 0 0.7. Here's a demonstration of how micro scattering can create distortion at the receivers. So you have an upcoming wave field that hits this small scale near surface with very slow velocities and hits the scatterers and then the energy transfers from the scatterer to the receiver. So these scatterers act like, in combination, they act like a complex antenna that distorts the source and receiver wave fields. If you have a receiver nearby, it can have a very different response function caused by these surface scatterers. We can measure the distortion of the source wavelet using the SEAM2 ARID VSP data. What we have some surface sources, and since this is synthetic data, we are going to have perfect sources, no vibrator variability. And we're going to place a receiver directly below each source. So we're going to look only at vertical ray paths, and we're going to place them below all reflectors. Now, there'll be some interbed multiples here, but the interbed multiples are going to be weak and a second order effect compared to the surface scattering. Here you see the source wavelet measured from the buried receiver. And I've plotted the surface geology down here. You can see that the surface geology strongly affects the wavelet. There are strong amplitude changes and there is much energy after the first peak. You can see the amplitude changes by focusing on the precursor event here. And you can see the amplitude changes are fairly significant. So these wavelet effects don't stack out because they are coherent noise and they can occur over thousands of meters in size. Note down here at the bottom, we measure the scattering, scattering ratio
and the ranges fall into what I previously described as bad data. Here's a demonstration of how the surface wavelet distortion harms imaging. And these are time slices from 3D PSTM for the SEAM2 Barrett data. Now, a nice thing about using synthetic model is that we know the correct answer, and that's what you see over here on the right. And there are some geobodies embedded in the model at this horizon. Now, on the left is the time slice with no surface distortion correction. Now, it looks plausible. You might think these are geobodies, but it is clearly wrong. And there's an imprint of the surface geology on this result. If we correct for the surface distortion here in the middle, you can see we get a good, accurate image. And these geobodies are now well resolved. Here's an example of surface scattering distortion and correction on uh, real data. Um, this is the early arrivals of a shot gather, and these are dense trace spacing. And here you can actually see these inverted Vs and hyperbolas from surface scattering. And with performing the correction, you can see the data is much more coherent. And if you look down deeper in these ellipses, you now see some coherent reflections here and here where you didn't see any before. Here's another example of surface scattering correction. This is a shot gather with NMO. And on the left, we see, well, this actually has some scattering corrections. We performed first order scattering corrections on this data. But then after performing the second higher order scattering corrections, you can see there's much more coherent energy. Now these aren't totally clean reflectors, but you'll see on the right side, they're gonna stack in a lot better than they do on the left-hand side. And the signal to noise has been improved maybe from 0 0.1 to 0 0.3. So, I mean, that is a significant improvement. Now, many land seismic experiences support the perspective of surface distortion of signal. And I don't have time to go through all this. You can pause and read these by yourself. In conclusion, the evidence of surface scattering distortion is strong. You see it in real data if you know how to look. Synthetic studies and VSP data support this. And the implications are significant. It affects processing in that you can recover more signal by undoing the distortion. And it affects acquisition in that super dense acquisition helps, but it won't solve all your problems. Dense acquisition can just record more distorted data. And it affects interpretation in that explains how your source and receiver wavelet may not be reliable. So why has this distortion not been recognized before? Well, we did recognize it, but we called it different things. For example, it's been commonly called poor coupling. But there was really not much you could do about it, so it didn't really matter dying into or diving into it. Now we can do something about it because we have the dense land data to resolve the distortion and undo it. So this recent land acquisition revolution not only helps with our old methods, but it enables new methods. Thank you very much.